What's up guys and welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hiya. How you doing? If you're into the history between the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to hear about Odysseus and Telemachus finally being reunited in Homer's Odyssey. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on top of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be going into book 16 of Homer's Odyssey. So if I could summarize book 16 into a one sentence it would actually just be exactly what I just said, which is just that Telemachus and Odysseus get reunited. There's nothing else that happens in this book, and that is obviously the most important thing, that finally father and son, after 20 odd years, finally see each other again, and they finally get to have this like father-son moment. It's just, it's so cute! So in saying that, why don't we just roll into the narrative so that I can just explain the whole scene and we can just get through it. So the book opens and it's dawn, so we're picking up sort of right where we left off, because in the end of the last book we've got Telemachus who's marching towards, marching, as if he's on like some little expedition. He's walking, he's having a nice leisurely walk towards uh, Eumaeus's hut, the swineherd's hut. So now we sort of pick up, but from the hut's point of view, like we're now inside the hut, right? So Odysseus and Eumaeus, they wake up, they start getting breakfast ready, we've got uh, Odysseus, again still in disguise, he goes out to find a little pig and to like come in, they're gonna kill it, they're gonna eat it, and all this other stuff. We've got Eumaeus, who's who's getting the wine together, he's mixing it in his bowl, and all of a sudden Odysseus notices that somebody is approaching the hut. So Telemachus is now literally outside the doors, and he notices this because the dogs start uh, going towards the door, and all of them sort of start, you know, like, uh, going up to see who it is. And Odysseus notices that it must be somebody that Eumaeus knows, because the dogs, unlike when he arrived, the dogs are not barking, the dogs are not attacking, the dogs are not threatened whatsoever. In fact, they go up to Telemachus and they start, like, nuzzling him and, you know, like, doing the cute the dogs do, that everybody's always like, oh my god, I love you! That's exactly what the dogs start doing. So Odysseus turns to Eumaeus and he says, I think your mate's approaching because the dogs are not threatened whatsoever, and Eumaeus is like, no way, who is that? And then he walks outside and he sees it's Telemachus, he drops his bowl of wine, and Homer describes him as, you know, running up to uh, Telemachus as if he's his father, and as if he would never see him again, as if his son only, like, just escaped death. Like, Eumaeus has such a great relationship with Telemachus, and that's so obvious in this moment. Like, he starts weeping, he, like, hugs him, he brings him to this huge bear hug and he's just like oh my god I thought I was never gonna see you again. So Eumaeus ushers Telemachus into the hut, they then have a little heart to heart and Telemachus says that he's actually there specifically to talk to Eumaeus specifically because he needs to know if Penelope has in his absence whilst he's been in Pelos if she has married another suitor um, in that time because he needs to know sort of like what he's walking into. Remember we have the whole Agamemnon story that's like hanging over everybody at this point and the suitors are terrifying so Telemachus has to ask him to just be like I just need to know if there's a possibility I'm gonna walk over there and like you know be killed that would be nice to know. Eumaeus assures Telemachus that she has not remarried that in fact she's been doing the same thing she's been doing this entire book which is that you know, every single time she feels sad and she misses Odysseus because she's super loyal she goes upstairs and she like wastes away the days by crying and all of this sort of stuff and as he's saying this he then picks up Telemachus's spear and he puts it against the wall and he uh, you know invites him to sit down because they're gonna you know they're gonna eat that's what they were doing so when he walks over to the table Table, Odysseus in disguise actually he stands up to offer his chair to the prince and Telemachus replies in a very very polite way where he just says you know what don't worry about it like you can totally sit down you're older than me you're a beggar whatever we'll find another chair for me don't worry about it you're chill. So Odysseus sits back down then Eumaeus brings in another chair for Telemachus they sit down all together they eat and when they have put aside their desire for food and drink again that's the exact quote in the Greek that's sort of like a little phrasing once they have done that then they all decide to have a chat. Telemachus asks Eumaeus who their guest is so he asks, you know, who this guy is and how he got to uh, Ithaca in the first place. And Eumaeus sort of launches into the whole story that Odysseus said in the last, not last book, but the book before. The whole bollocks, totally ridiculous story about how he's from Crete and all this bullshit. He explains that to Telemachus, but he does end this by saying that now that Telemachus is home, that he says, you know, you can do whatever you want to him, he relies on you for shelter. Now shelter, this word, is a word that Telemachus really sticks to, that he's just like, oh shelter, oh you think I can offer him shelter? Funny, because the last thing that I remember is that all the suitors were living in my palace, I've got no control over the shelter. He explains this by saying that he barely trusts himself to fight off somebody else, so if he's gonna bring a guest into the palace then he can't fight for himself and fight for somebody else because he's not that good of a warrior. This is something that I do love Telemachus for, that he's super self-aware of what his strengths and what his weaknesses are. And this is one of those moments where he says it, that he's just like, I can't invite this guy in to the palace because the suitors are, again, they're crazy, they are so rude, they are abusive, all of this sort of stuff, and he says, I can't protect him from them and they're probably gonna eat him alive 
anyways. So what he suggests to Eumaeus instead is that the guest can stay with Eumaeus in his hut at the farmstead uh, until Telemachus has control over the palace and all of this. But what he can do is he can send rations of food from the palace down to the farmstead uh, to feed this beggar, to feed this guest. Uh, so that that way he's not eating Eumaeus out of house and home. Odysseus now speaks up and he says that the sound of the suitors genuinely breaks his heart and he says he's really sorry to Telemachus that he has to deal with this but he does ask if it's Telemachus allowing the abuse or if it's that the people are being encouraged by like a god or something like that so he has no control over the abusive behavior of the um, suitors. That's what he says to Telemachus. He says, are you allowing it or is it God? A God, not the God obviously. Is it a God who is allowing uh, this behavior to happen to you? And he ends by asking if he has any brothers maybe who can help support him because if he's doing this all on his own, it sounds like it's really hard, right? Which <laughs> it does. And Telemachus then replies and he says that actually the way that his family works is that there's only a singular son in like each generation. So he goes through and he says that Laertes, who's Odysseus's dad, he was the only son from his parents and then Laertes' only son was Odysseus and then Odysseus' only son is Telemachus. So he's like, I don't have any brothers and I don't have any family in that sense to help me because that's just the way that my family works, unfortunately. But Telemachus says that the only reason why he has to deal with this alone is not necessarily because he doesn't have any brothers but because Odysseus himself left him with all of this misery and all of this sorrow to handle this bullshit by himself. He says he's gonna explain the story to Odysseus in disguise. He says, you know what, you don't actually know what's going on. And so he says that all of these people from the surrounding islands and all of these Ithacans, all of these lords of Ithacans have come to court his mother. So they are all existing within the palace. And he says that, you know, they can't get rid of them because Odysseus is gone because they all believe that he is dead. And Penelope, as we've heard multiple times before, she doesn't accept any offers, but she doesn't reject any either. So she's sort of sitting on the fence. She doesn't really know what to do. And that is a sentiment that is said throughout this entire book as well. So he just reiterates that to a decent disguise, being like, you know, my mum isn't exactly helping the situation. So really, I'm all alone. But now he turns to Eumaeus and he asks that Eumaeus goes down to the palace to tell Penelope that he's alive because he says he doesn't want to go and do it right away. And obviously, as we know, that that was his instructions as well, that he's supposed to have Eumaeus go and tell uh, Penelope and send the message to her. So he just reiterates that to Eumaeus right now. And he says, let her know that I came back safe and sound from Pelos and that I will come and see her shortly. But he does say that no other Greek can hear him. He says this stays between you and my mama, okay? No one else could know because he's obviously worried it's going to get back to the suitors. Eumaeus obviously understands his point of view and he does say that to Telemachus. He says, I get that you only want Penelope to know. However, he asks if he should go and talk to Laertes, who's his grandfather, who's Odysseus' father. And he says, you know, this is a guy who before you left was at least eating and drinking, coming down to the farm. He was apparently helping out on the farm uh, and, and, you know, helping in the fields and all of this. But as soon as as soon as Telemachus left, that apparently he shied away from food and drink, he could not, he didn't have the strength to go and work anymore. Telemachus hasn't been gone for that long, okay? But apparently, nope, no food, no drinking, no nothing. He goes full sad boy mode, and apparently he's just been home, and he's not even been like accepting visitors and all this sort of stuff, which is why Eumaeus is like, should I go and at least tell him because he's not doing so well? And Telemachus just says, look, that really sucks, and I'm really sorry to hear that, but at the same time, no, I want you to just go and tell my mum. And he says, you haven't got any time to stop off and to, you know, roam the fields to go and find this wandering sad man out there like no don't do that go and tell Penelope and if you so wish you can tell one of her serving maid maidens maids serving maids serving women serving women and you can go and tell one of them to go and tell Laertes later on but this is the only move that I want you to do at the moment um, and so you may see him as you may leaves Athena notices this and she immediately takes stance at the door to like the whole uh, hut you know she comes down and she like sort of pokes around the door to look at Odysseus but she's sort of in line obviously because the hut isn't that big she She's still in line of Telemachus, but she only appears to Odysseus because obviously gods can choose who sees them and who doesn't. And she appears as this like beautiful tall woman. And she just looks at Odysseus, she like raises an eyebrow to be like, get your f***ing booty over here. I got something to say to you. So Odysseus gets up and he gets his little booty over to the door and he stands in front of her. And she just says, now is the time that you must tell Telemachus who you are. You've got to be honest with him. You guys have to decide on a way to defeat the suitors together now. And so after she says this and Odysseus just kind of nods, he's just like, yes, I'm so ready for this. She then removes his disguise, right? So, you know, we see his whole appearance change. It's a very like Cinderella kind of moment, the way that it's described, where it's like, you know, his rags were lifted and then, you know, his hair was done. All of a sudden he had a beard. His, his jaw was like super cut and, you know, like fresh and all of this. And so he like looks really nice. Tanned, again, that's a nice little detail that his skin gets a little bit darker because he's not so, you know, like wrinkly and like looking really sickly. That like, he's got a nice glow to him. And he turns around to walk back into the hut. Bear in mind, Telemachus has just seen an old man walk out and now sees a young man walk in. He's like, what the f 
fuck is going on? So naturally, Telemachus turns around and he thinks that Odysseus is an actual god, right? Otherwise, how else could he change his appearance like this? And so he starts saying, you know, all the things that have changed about Odysseus. And he says, you know, you must be a god. Please spare me. I'm going to make all of these, you know, sacrifices and all these offerings to you and all this. If you're going to be nice to me, like he literally begs Odysseus and Odysseus is just like, no, not a god. In fact, he introduces himself in a really weird way, in my opinion, where he says, I'm your dad. I'm the reason why you're suffering so much and why you've had to endure so much abuse, which I'm like, that's a really weird way of opening this with your child who you literally haven't seen since he was yay big. And you're like, yeah, you know all that pain that you feel? My fault. Not the best selling point, Odysseus. But he's so caught up in the moment that he just starts crying. Like tears are streaming down his face and Homer lets us know that even though he's had control over his emotions up until now, you know, like seeing Telemachus and being in the hut and everything and being on Ithaca, that now it's just all coming out. And apparently he's got so many, like so much tears are coming out of his eyes. So many tears even. What is the correct English in that sentence? Who gives a shit? You get it? It's a whole waterfall happening right now that literally the whole ground is just like, you know, coated with water. There are like puddles beneath him. But Telemachus doesn't actually believe that it's his dad because, well, I mean, he's gone through quite a shock, right? Again, old man walked out, young man come in. He goes, wow, this is a god. The guy goes, no, I'm your dad. Telemachus is like, what is happening? Telemachus says that the only way he couldn't be a god because he's still stuck on this. He says the only way that you couldn't be a god is if a god... Uh, did this to you, that a god is the person who came down, you know, did this whole magical thing, but he's like, that doesn't normally happen. And so he's just kind of staring at Odysseus. He's totally like marveling at him. And Odysseus is like, hey son, I know that we just met, but like, it's kind of rude to marvel at people. For someone who's so wily with words, I feel like this interaction is not the smoothest. But obviously he explains to Telemachus in this moment that it's Athena who's actually on his side. And it's Athena who's the one that did the whole thing that Telemachus just described, which we obviously just read. He says that she's the one who's been helping him because it's no work for gods to actually like do this to mortals. He's like, it's, it's it's like the easiest thing. Believe me, it's happened to me like twice now. And that is enough. I don't know why that's necessarily enough, but that's enough for Telemachus to be like, it's my dad. And so they have this really cute moment where they like hug and they cry. And Homer tells that they would have literally cried. Bear in mind, it's like breakfast, right? And they would have cried until the sun went down had not Telemachus decided to like keep talking because they were just sitting there and crying together because obviously they haven't seen each other in 20 years. So he leans back though, as tears are still streaming down his face, and he asks Odysseus how he ended up getting back to Ithaca, who brought him back to Ithaca, mainly because he doesn't believe that he walked, obviously because it's an island. And so Odysseus says, okay, I'll tell you the whole story. So he updates him on the whole Phaeacians thing, how the Phaeacians are like really good seafaring people, how they brought him back, how he was asleep on the boat, how he, you know, all of this stuff that we've read, he updates him on all of that, including all of the gifts being in the cave and all the sort of shebang. But he doesn't want the conversation to focus on that. So instead he tells Telemachus that he needs sort of like a tally of what's going on in the palace. He needs to know how many suitors are there. He needs to know how many people are still on their side, you know, like him and Telemachus side on, on their family side. He needs to know what's going on before he can make any moves so that they can plan together what to do and what moves to make now that he is home. Mainly because he doesn't know if he has to go and get backup, which I think is a really valid point. He's like, do I have to make a whole little mini army here of Ithacan that are still on our side or can we take them just like the two of us? And obviously Telemachus turns around and goes, there's no way that the two of us can take all these suitors because, and he tells us, I had to write down the numbers obviously because I was never gonna remember that. So Telemachus tells us, by the way, I'm just gonna be including like the island name beneath because there are three main ones and I don't actually know how to pronounce any of them. Again, Greek people, I love it when you guys write things down phonetically uh, below in the comments that we can all learn from you. So let me know. But anyway, so the first island, we have 52 men and six servants, right? So that's one island loads, okay? So we've got that many from the first island. We then from the second island have 24 men that have come from there. And the third island, we have 20 men from that specific place. Now from Ithaca, though we've got 12 men. And along with the 12 men, we then have Medan, who we've met before. And we have two henchmen who are also with Medan, who like communicate between the Ithacans and um, Penelope, right? So that's sort of like a little party from Ithaca. Now in total, I also obviously did the maths for you guys. In total, not including Medan and the two henchmen because we've met them before, but not including them, it's 114 men. 114 men that are inhabiting the palace. If you guys want to get a gauge of how many suitors there are. It's a whole party of people that have just decided to sit. No wonder they can't do anything about 114 men. We're not talking 10 or 20, like Telemachus just told us. We're talking a whole mob. It's also mad when you think that the palace has enough room for all those people. That's also a thing that I really focus on where I'm just like, that was a big palace. We've got 114 people quite cozy in there. Considering they've stayed there for years, so they must be comfortable. Anyways, totally not the point of this episode. Telemachus basically uses this number to just tell Odysseus that the, the two of them obviously could not fight off the suitors by themselves. And he says that even if they could, even if they figured out a way to do it, it's not wise because 
there are too many of them that they will end up like Odysseus and Telemachus will end up having revenge inflicted on them by either, you know, one of their family members or one of their children or something like that. So he's like, it's not a good idea. At least there's safety in numbers. So if you can rile up anybody to fight with us against the suitors, then at least it's like two mini sort of armies against each other. Odysseus has a sassy response and he's a bit like, what about Zeus and Athena? Do they count as team members? And Telemachus is like, well, they're gods. So they're probably sitting in the sky ruling over all of men. Why the would they care about our little teeny tiny battle here on Ithaca? Which, valid point. Though Odysseus says that now because it's daybreak that they should probably stop chatting anyways, that he'll figure it out. And that in fact, Telemachus should go down to the palace to go and mingle with all of the suitors to show that he's, you know, alive and that he's ready and that he's there and all of this sort of stuff. Now, he also says in this moment that he's planning on having Eumaeus lead him down in disguise as a beggar still to the palace to go and, you know, mix with the suitors that way so that no one knows that he's, you know, back on Ithaca, right? This is part of the whole grand plan. So he says, you know, when I go down there though, you've got to not jump in to protect me. If the suitors decide to attack me, if they decide to verbally or physically attack me, you cannot do anything. Don't even try. In fact, he says that the only thing that Telemachus can do is to try and reason with them and to try and be friendly with them and to try and be nice with them. Because remember, they can't let the suitors know that anything is going on. But he says that Athena is on their side. And so when the time is right and Athena lets Odysseus know that the time is right, he's going to give a signal to Telemachus that he must then take all of the the like arms, all of the, the swords and the spears and everything out of the hall and to go and hide them in a storeroom. So he says, I'm gonna give you the signal, right? We're gonna, we're gonna make sure that that's the case. And the only thing that you're gonna leave in the hall are weapons for the two of them. Leave enough for them to have access to, like a shield, a sword, a spear, and all of this, and hide the rest of them so that, that way the suitors cannot attack them. Athena and Zeus will also come in in this moment and daze the suitors so that they also have an advantage over this, you know, vast number of people because there's just the two of them. But Odysseus ends this by saying that, you know, you are my one true son and all of this sort of stuff. Now you must do me a favor and you must not tell Eumaeus that I am who I am. And you must not tell Penelope. You must not tell anybody that I have arrived home. Instead, he wants to first of all test the serving maids to see who within the palace is still on his side and is still loyal to him and loyal to his wife. And he wants to do that without them, you know, having knowledge that Odysseus is back on Ithaca or anything like that, because obviously that can change their perception and the way that they handle this. Now, to Telemachus doesn't necessarily say that the whole plan is stupid. <laughs> Let's just start off by saying that. But he does say that the majority of the plan is stupid because he says, if you want to come to the palace for a long period of time, uh, that's not going to work because the suitors literally won't give you any food. They won't give you anything to drink. So you're going to be starving for uh, the duration of the time that you are, you know, running around trying to have this whole plan happen and, you know, talk to all the serving women. Even though he does think that talking to the serving women and figuring out who is loyal to Penelope is a good idea. He's just sort of, you know, nitpicking, being like, you don't know the suitors like I do. And so we kind of end the conversation there where we sort of start seeing that it's a back and forth between the two of them, that Odysseus, even though he is very smart, Telemachus is still smart and he's still offering his own input and he's not scared to sort of say, you know, like, I understand that you're supposed to be this really brave um, man in battle. And you're supposed to be this really smart man because obviously Telemachus has heard all these wonderful things about his dad, but he's like, again, I'm the one who knows the suitors, so you also need to listen to me. And they they talk and they speak really well as a team, I have to say, and I think that everybody would agree when reading um, this scene, but that's how it ends, right? It ends that way. And then we cut actually to the palace where we cut to Eumaeus, who's now running up to the palace and actually one of the guys from Telemachus's boat that he had, you know, sent round to the side of Ithaca back to the port, they arrive in the palace at the same time to tell Penelope that Telemachus is home. So this guy stands up in front of everybody and he just kind of yells and he's like, hey, Telemachus is back. And then he off, right? But in the hall are all of the suitors. So all of the suitors are like, excuse me, you think what? Um, how? What? Because remember, they think that, you know, Telemachus should have been killed by that little ambush. After this, Eumaeus walks right up to Penelope and he actually whispers more details to her, being like, you know, he's in my hut and all of this and whatever. And Penelope is more so calmed by this. And then Eumaeus leaves to then go back to um, the, the farmstead and to go back and meet Telemachus and Odysseus in disguise. What he leaves behind though is a bunch of panicked suitors, okay? So they all then decide to leave the hall and they go to their little meeting ground, which they have, you know, set up right by the gates of the palace because they are not home. Remember, they have just made themselves at home. So they've also made themselves a little meeting ground place and they all go there to speak. Eurymachus stands up and he tells all of them that this is obviously not good and that one of them needs to send a messenger to the boat that is waiting for Telemachus to come back because remember they wanted to kill him um, so that they know that Telemachus has made it back and that he is in fact alive and that they missed him. And as he's saying this, this guy called An... Aww. I did write it down because I knew I was never going to remember it. Am Finn... Am Amphinomus. Please, a Greek person, tell me how to pronounce that. But that guy stands up and he, funnily enough, is just like, hey, I know that you think this, but it looks like there's a boat that's approaching. I guess that they got the memo before we even had to send a messenger to them. And all of them turn around and the boat is approaching and all of the men are on it and they like do not look happy, obviously, because they 
Miss Telemachus, and that was their one job was to kill him. So all the men run down to the shore and they all, you know, help the men get off the boat and everything like that. And then they walk them all back to the meeting grounds where Antinous, the probably the most problematic of all the suitors, along with Eurymachus, to be quite honest, both of them are like issues. He stands up though and he addresses all of them. He tells them that a god must be on Telemachus' side because he's like, there is no way that he could have gone past this without a god because they apparently just like didn't sleep. Like, like, like not all of them were asleep at the same time. Obviously they slept. But they had, during the day, they had a lookout point where then some people would sleep during the day. People were constantly watching for Telemachus. And then at night, they would have the same thing where they wouldn't go back on land in order to sleep, that they would just sleep on the boat and people would still be watching to make sure that they didn't miss Telemachus. So he's like, there's no way that he sailed past us, that God must have told him to go a different route because we would have had him. We would have killed him by now. Antonis does note to us in this moment though that Telemachus is smart, that he says that he's a schemer and that he has a way with words. So we know that he is somewhat like Odysseus, even, you know, not just to Odysseus's friends, but also to the people who are there, that he says that because of this, he is worried that when Telemachus comes back, when he, you know, reaches, you know, the palace and everything, he's going to tell everybody that the suitors were plotting to kill him. And thus he's going to turn the majority of Ithacans against the suitors, which obviously isn't good for them because there are more Ithacans than there are suitors. And he's worried that all of them will be driven onto strangers' lands um, after that and because of that. His solution to this, though, is that they must kill Telemachus first. He's just like, we got to strike first and we got to kill him and we can't let him kill us first and we can't let him go and talk to the Ithacans because it will be a problem. And he says that once they all kill Telemachus, then they can all, you know, split up everything that he owns. But apart from the palace, the palace will stay with Penelope. And then Penelope will then give the palace to whoever she chooses as a new husband, right? So that's sort of how his little speech ends. Now you would assume based on sort of the pathway that the suitors have responded and based on how Homer, you know, tends to write mobs in regards to war and all of this, that they would like cheer and be like, yeah, that is absolutely not what happens. That in fact, all the suitors are just like, what the f is wrong with you. Like you have gone loco, my man. In fact, the guy that spoke before, the guy by the name of Amphinomus, again, Greek person, help me. But that guy stands up again. And we actually find out from Homer that he's the only one who has slightly turned Penelope's head because he has like a real way with words. Like apparently he has like a really nice voice and he has a really good vocabulary and all this sort of stuff. So he's the only one that has slightly turned her head and he stands up and he actually says to all of them, right, I have zero desire to kill Telemachus. His, his reasoning for it is that it's not good to try and kill a blood of kings. Like, like that's not a bloodline of kings even. He says that is not a good thing to do. It's not a good thing in the eyes of the gods, not a good thing in the eyes of the people. So he shouldn't be doing that. But he does end it by saying that if Zeus permits it, if Zeus wants it to happen, then he's like, well, I'll kill him myself. If Zeus says that Telemachus is going to die, then I'll do it. But Zeus hasn't made that very clear to us. So I don't think that we should be, you know, trying to kill Telemachus if he's already back on homeland and if he has the power to do all this stuff. And considering he's the prince, not a good idea. So he just kind of turns around to go back to the palace. He's like, I'm hungry and I want to go home and I want to eat something. And luckily for us and luckily for him in, in the story that all the suitors agree with him and they all sort of turn around to go back to the hall. When they get back to the hall, Penelope is now inspired to go down and speak to them. It's sort of like how I said before, where she comes down with like handmaids on either side of her and she sort of stands there and she's just like demanding attention from these suitors being like, who did they think they are? Because we know that she knows from Medan that all of the suitors have been trying to kill Telemachus, right? So she's aware of this. And she now takes her time to go and attack Antinous. And in fact, she calls him all of these names and she says, who the f do you think you are trying to kill my son? Basically, obviously I'm paraphrasing, but she does reiterate a story about his father, which is actually very interesting, where she says that you have no reason, Antinous, to be acting this way because my husband has always been good to your family. Now, this is a very hospitable uh, thing to do in regards to like guest friendships and all of this. So Antonis's dad at one point had decided to go off on this like little pirate voyage adventure and attack these allies of the Ithacans, right? And so when he came back to Ithaca, most people were just like, who the f do you think you are attacking our allies who have helped us through X, Y, and Z? And it was Odysseus who told all of them to calm down. He was like, he's one of us, he's one of the family, whatever, accepted him again into the palace and basically forgave him for attacking their allies, which is a big thing that Odysseus did in order to make sure that people, the people of Ithaca didn't just start killing Antinous' dad, you know, thank you, because now Antinous is a being. Hello. So basically she just says it's rich that now he's trying to kill Odysseus' son, even though her family uh, and her husband and everything has been nothing but nice to his. Before Antinous can actually stand up to defend himself, it's Eurymachus who stands up. And Eurymachus stands up and he spouts a load of bullshit in this moment. He just turns to Penelope and he's like, I cannot believe that people are trying to kill Telemachus. I see Telemachus as my own son. If anybody tries and does that, you know, don't worry Penelope because 
anybody tries. I will protect him and I will make sure that he is safe and sound because I honor him as my own family. And Homer tells us in this moment that he doesn't mean any of it. And in fact, even though all these words are coming out of his mouth, he's thinking about how he is going to be killing Telemachus. So we know that everybody in this room is just lying. And Penelope starts feeling the pressure. She's just like, this, I'm gonna go to bed. And so she just leaves and she goes upstairs, she starts crying as she does all the time. That's, that's you know, the, the, the way that it's written. That's the way that Penelope is written in this book. And Athena sees that she's crying. And so she's just like, you can sleep. I'm gonna close your eyes. And so Penelope then passes out. As this is happening, we cut back to Eumaeus who is now appearing at his hut and it's now dusk. So Odysseus and Telemachus are getting dinner ready, but Odysseus is now back in his original disguise as a beggar because obviously he doesn't want uh, Eumaeus to, you know, just basically turn on his heels and go back to the palace and tell everybody that Odysseus is home. Telemachus asks him how the town was and Eumaeus then updates him saying, you know, I didn't see much of the town. I just went straight to the palace and all of this. However, I did see your boat pull in. He was like, I actually ran into your herald. And also he thinks, he says that on his way back, he thinks that he saw the suitors coming in um, who had planned to ambush Telemachus, but he says, I didn't stop for very long and I wasn't very close, so I don't entirely know, but I think that now they're all back in the palace. And as he says this, there's a moment where Odysseus and Telemachus just sort of like look up at each other and they make this eye contact just out of line of Eumaeus that Eumaeus can't catch it and they don't, you know, meet his gaze. But they have this little moment of just like, aha, now is the f time. And that is where the book ends. Yay! So finally, we have father and son that have met up again. They have now been reunited. It was a very, very cute moment, but I know that this book is a little bit longer because there wasn't as much that I could cut out. You guys know that I always try and cut out as much as possible, but unfortunately this book, kind of everything is needed. And even for class, everything is needed because these things set up the next couple of books of, of this whole this whole poem. So you do need to kind of pay attention to all of those little puzzle pieces that have now come into place. But yeah, thank you guys for tuning into book 16 and we'll be seeing you next week with book 17 of Homer's Odyssey. So I'll see you then.